Hello, everybody. Welcome to Brain Club. I'm Mel Hauser. I use she, they pronouns. I'm the executive director here at All Brains Belong. Welcome to our part two of making work work for your brain. First, to orient us to Brain Club, um, it's of course our education program to provide education to the broader ABB community about our approach to neuroinclusive community culture. This is about bringing people together to develop a shared vision, promoting new ways of thinking and being. So with the idea that you then go out into the rest of your world and that this is this is how systems change happens. This is a place that we hope where you'll feel safe, where you experience uh, how culture can be different, a place to collectively learn and unlearn together. And although ABB has a variety of different types of programs. This one is not for medical or mental health advice. It's not a support group or a place to make personal requests or problem solve or troubleshoot personalized needs. Um, uh, instead, um, we, we invite you to explore today's big picture theme and share ideas or reflections related to the topic of discussion. Um, as always, we begin with our community agreement where all paths to participation are okay and welcome. You can have your video on or off. Even if it's on, we don't expect anything of you. You certainly do not need you to sit still or look at the camera or any of those other neuronormative constructs. So feel free to um, move, walk, fidget, stim, eat, anything, anything that needs doing. Um, you can um, ask questions, make comments in the chat as we go. We have uh, our staff uh, uh, fielding chat questions as we go. Um, and uh, observation is a valid form of participation as well. In addition to affirming all aspects of identity, um, in order to make this uh, safe for all participants, we do prioritize the group's collective needs over that of the individual. So just be mindful of language used and access needs of, of everybody. So what are access needs? If you're new to Brain Club, you talk, we, you'll hear us, we talk a lot about access needs. Access needs being anything that is required for full and meaningful participation um, in whatever you're doing. Everyone with all types of brains has access needs, all different types of access needs. So uh, some of the access needs that come up at Brain Club um, relate to um, uh, communication and processing. So first, um, uh, closed captioning is enabled. You just have to toggle it on if you'd like to use it. So depending on your version of Zoom, you might see the live transcript closed captioning icon. But if not, look for the more dot 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 and choose show subtitles. You can also do the same and choose hide subtitles if you want to turn them off. Um, that's the chat window, and the chat is another good topic to talk about um, access needs and conflicting access needs. Conflicting access needs in the chat are sometimes um, uh, a lot. Um, the chat is, for many community members, a way of participating and accessing in Brain Club. Um, it's what affords access, actually, so to many people. It's the ability to communicate without mouth words. It's the idea of having more processing time. Um, you know, you something happens, you then maybe 10 minutes later, you have a thought about it right in the chat. Um, it's also a way of having direct engagement between community members. And for other community members, the chat is a nightmare um, in terms of the visual clutter and even a startle response when things pop up and bounce around. Um, it can be really, really distracting, especially if it's moving pretty quickly. So we have a couple of thoughts about how to navigate conflicting access needs in the chat. So if you are bothered by the chat, um, two things you can try. One is after the first pop-up, try not closing the window. This way that the words will change, but it won't pop ev up every time. It's when you close it, then it pops up again. So pop up once, stay there, don't pop again. You can also try disabling chat preview where um, next to the little chat icon, a chat, like the speech bubble icon, there's a little up carrot. If you click on that, it'll say show chat previews with a checkbox. You tap on that or click on that and the checkbox goes away. So that's another way of making that pop up thing not happen. If you are using the chat, um, we ask that you use the big box for all your chat usage. We're trying to avoid the threads or the replies because that's actually what makes the chat 
bounce and makes it really hard to read um, for for us as as facilitators and our team here. It's hard to keep up with everything when it's bouncing. So we just ask that you type your message here in the big box. And uh, together we will figure out conflicting access needs in the chat. Thank you. So we're continuing our brain club, our June brain club theme of small changes, big impact. Um, we talk a lot here about niche construction, right? So niche construction is a term coined by Dr. Thomas Armstrong in his book, The Power of Neurodiversity. And niche construction refers to that you learn about your brain and your brain's needs, and you design a life based on those needs. Unfortunately, we don't have niche construction a lot of the time, um, all too often, um, it's the square peg being hammered to fit into the round hole. And what happens? You break the peg. And um, as it relates to employment, there's a lot of that. Um, there's a lot of that where, you know, um, not surprisingly, um, autistic people have, you know, uh, two and a half to eight times higher rates of unemployment. ADHD or 75 percent uh, have have struggled with employment. And so um, we know is that employment and health are related in both directions. And so this, you know, one size fits all shove the people into the containers thing. It's really bad for health. And that's why for the past two years, um, we've been including um, employment uh, monthly at Brain Club. So um. In addition to employment support programs for our patients here, um, All Brains Belong has a neuro-inclusive employer bright spotting program. Um, we've been running this for about a year and a half now um, with the idea that Vermonters can nominate employers who are creating workplaces where people with all types of brains can get their needs met and thrive. Um, and uh, what happens after after someone nominates an employer? We contact them, we figure out what they do, um, and uh, we, we and we recognize them and spread the word that this is a place, this is a safe place. And what we've learned through this program um, is that there really are predictable elements of a neuro inclusive workspace relating to the physical environment, communication, workplace culture opportunities for meaningful work, which is, is an access need for many people, flexibility and choices, autonomy and balancing autonomy with structure and support, um, and differentiation, having multiple different ways of participating in workflows and routines, meetings, the, all the things that go into different types of work. So um, uh, and intermittently at, at Brain Club, we have um, uh, employers recognize through this program, they come on to Brain Club and talk about what they do. And so it's, um, uh, uh, we, we, um, we learn, we learn a lot through this program. Um, what, uh, Lizzie's going to put in the chat is actually a, 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 a link to all of the free neuro-inclusive employment resources that we have. Um, that not only is it recordings from past employment brain clubs, but there's a whole bunch of blog posts and a whole bunch of a whole bunch of things um, relating to neuro inclusive employment. Um, because it's the idea of just like modeling, modeling what's possible, giving people ideas of maybe what they can try to bring about in their own lives. Um, uh, some some uh, me and many times it's it's uh, meeting your access needs does require you know collaboration, support with a supervisor, arranging at these things in interactive dialogue. But sometimes there are some small things that people can do on their own if they know what they need, which is a big assumption. Um, so this quote from one of our community members from a few years ago, I don't know what my access needs are. I just know they're not being met. Yup. So that's 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 why having conversations like the one we're going to have tonight, um, it's for purposes of just like prompting, prompting reflection on like, oh, that yeah, that might be actually something that I might need in my workspace. Um, so, so so that's that's the purpose of tonight. So um, we're going to watch. It's going to be about a about a 30 minute video, a pre-recorded conversation um, with uh, some of our staff here at All Brains Belong 
um, Lizzie Peratt, our education programs coordinator, Sarah Wilkins, our community programs coordinator, and Olivia Tyler, our patient care coordinator. And I, we recorded part of a, a staff meeting um, uh, talking about small ways that we meet our access needs at work and how we have personally navigated that process in, in small ways that have like a fairly significant impact. So uh, David, take it away. We're just having our team meeting, right? We, we're once a month, we reflect on, you know, we reflect on the past month, like what worked, what didn't work, um, you know, what did we learn about our access needs? How are they met? How are they not met? Like all of that stuff. So like, what has been the impact of reflecting on your access needs? Um, um, I think that having the um, template to fill out at the end of each month, it really helps me just slow down and remember that I do have access needs and just uh, spend some time and think about how the month went, went. It's been really helpful for me just to have that rhythm of here comes the template and now it's time to really look back and think what worked for my brain, what didn't work for my brain, what did I like, what didn't I like. So it's just been a really kind of like a, a new process for me. And I really like having the template um, laid out that helps me organize my thoughts and helps me get everything down. So this is our this is our template. Um, we've got our roles. We've got our what worked well, what's not working, number one priority, not priorities, but priority singular. How will you know this month will be successful? Um, and then, you know, like, like really, I mean, everything's talking about access needs, but this concept of being, I was just checking that, like, I actually shared screen because I don't see the little green thing. Anyway, um, you're seeing this, right? Okay, great. Okay. Anyway. Um, you know, anyway, like structured reflection on like meta access needs. And so, you know, when people, they, some people type in ahead of time to have like processing time. Some people like the way I do this sometimes is I like leave it open while I'm doing other stuff. And then I like, oh yeah, that's not working. And I write it down. So, so like, just, just, I think part of universal design for employment is giving lots of options to do everything. Yeah, I think having it scheduled and as something that you routinely do at the end of the month, like forces you to slow down and think about this stuff, because I think it is so easy to just like get into the grind of all the things that need to happen. And it's sometimes difficult to like slow down and zoom out and really reflect and, and try to learn from like what worked or didn't work and, you know, what you can do differently moving forward. So, um, yeah, it's I think it's a great practice to have together and it also teaches us a lot about each other and like, oh, yeah, this was hard for this person. And like, now I have that information and I can support them in this way, maybe because I've learned that, you know, this is important for them or, you know, what works or doesn't work for everyone else on the team. Love that, right? Because like, you know, so we we have this practice of we have this dedicated like retrospective look at the month and we like we like discipline ourselves to not be problem solving or like planning during that. We're just going backwards and documenting. Um, and th but then right after that, we shifted to a like forward thinking meeting where we planned we planned stuff based on what we learned at the retrospective look and like based on like okay now we learned that this is an access need for one of our team members like how are we going to do things differently to make that happen yeah i i think that's i i'll say that similar to what everyone else said it's definitely um um first of all is remembering to do it is an access need to like reflect having the time to do it um allow which is huge like having time in our week to take time to do that is a huge gift, you know, especially in the workplace. Like who's ever had that experience before <laughs> where you have time to self-reflect and think about what's working for you, what's not working for you, and then brainstorm with the team on how we can 
make it better or change it yeah right like i like thanks for naming that right because i think we should name that for brain club attendees like we're doing this as our meeting it's not like extra mm -hmm. it, it is the meeting so it's and it, it's 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 also multimodal so you can type into a google document template ahead of time if you want you can use mouth words you can type in the chat synchronously if you want and it's like just allowing people to express their truths in whatever way is accessible in that moment and that requires the system to remain flexible um you know there are some real downsides in using some of the, you know, the tech systems or like the things that are in our technology stack. Like there are some downsides that require a lot of like manual brain power to do the thing. But but those choices are made in order to preserve flexibility. And I think that's another like small thing, big impact that makes a makes a big difference because we need to allow for everyone to do the thing in their own way and to be empowered to make little changes. And if you have a system that confines you, that dictates how you do your work, that sucks. It sucks to be like, you know, and and, and I mean, this is this, you know, in, in, in the traditional healthcare system where, you know, here's the electronic health record and you will use this one and it is, this is how it is. And, you know, you know practice is paying like $100,000 for it. And like, there, there's a lot of investment in making that thing work, even though it doesn't work for you. And so I think that's another like, important, important thing is just like, when, when building systems, you know, for anyone who's like in a place of, you know, influence or you know making when you're making decisions about some some things that you have agency over making decisions about like how do i maximize flexibility otherwise that doesn't that's like the prerequisite that allows someone to do the things that we've talked about like the little tweaks the little experiments i'll try it this way and if it doesn't work i can tweak it again like just the constant tweaking yeah, I love the flexibility of the template. Sometimes I fill it out like, you know, I sit there and I do it right when it comes in on a Friday. Sometimes I'm working on something else and I fill it out back and forth. Um, this morning I filled it out after looking at um, other people on the team's entries and then that sparked some ideas for me. So yeah, I have the novelty plus the sameness access need for myself. So I like to change it up, but I also like the consistency of the template. I have an access need for sameness and novelty at the exact same time. And so like that, those, that that's my truth. And so I have to figure out how I'm gonna do that. I'm gonna have to have a system and that system is going to have to change. One of the things that happened this morning um, was I was on the phone with Sierra and we were talking about something and we realized that we forgot to make the group, like it's our, it's our job that on the first weekend of the month, we make our, you know, our, our, our part of our medical schedule and we didn't do it. And Lizzie needs it. I don't even really know if you need it tomorrow. Like you probably don't need it tomorrow, but like, we were supposed to follow supposed to follow the system and we didn't our our access needs weren't supported because we can't just remember like we can't just remember like that's like a neuronormative construct that i can just remember things that are important if i could just remember things that are important like i don't even know because i, I don't even know right so we need a visual support and we need the visual support to not be in a place that is cluttered and overstimulating it needs to be at a place where we look it probably needs to be on a calendar. There needs to be some sort of like checklist, task analysis of like what goes on. And it needs to be in a place that we look, not a place like we have a lot of documents in this place, but you know, they're not necessarily in places where we look. So um, we didn't do the thing. And we didn't do the thing. And we don't feel bad about ourselves because we didn't do the thing. We're like, we didn't do the thing because our access needs were not met. Okay. So now we have well, this thing has to be done right before our meeting because that's when it's supposed to be done by. So we took 15 minutes and we like banged out the schedule and the schedule is good and it's clean and it's neat. And it was like, 
this usually takes us a really long time and we did it in 15 minutes and we realized that actually this actually works better for us to like have the urgency of like you will get the thing done and you will get the thing done now and we just got a bunch of dopamine and we focused and we like and we we did it we weren't exhausted afterwards we weren't exhausted at all or if we whereas if we took like our usual time which is two hours to do this task like we we still terrible afterwards but we because we, we don't have stamina for that and so as time goes by we start losing it's like it's it's like your child Sarah not being able to plan going on a picnic by the time I got to like letter twenty five you know anyway so so um that little tweak like now we're going to actually plan to do the thing last minute kind of like lizzie and i we plan to do the brain club slides like well lizzie does them in advance but then i do my part like as brain club starting because that's my access need often people will ask you for feedback or for what's working and what's not working right and then it just disappears into the vault of all you know concerns and things that are not working but we actually want to do something about it. Oh, I love that point, right? So, so, so it's like of all the times that I've given feedback in my life, um, especially when there's a power dynamic and like my feedback like goes into the abyss and I never hear from it again, right? Like, is that, did, did someone not care about me or did someone have executive functioning differences that they were unaware of, right? Like, so that nobody's aware of, nobody talks about these things, mm -hmm. right? So the reason that we, I think the reason that we, actually do the things that make like forward incremental progress of our own access needs is that we are it's like very meta like we are supporting our access needs with systems to support our access needs so like we have this google document and we type into it while people are reflecting we like are also like collecting action items and then you know, like we put the action items in a new place where we're actually looking at them every week mm. and we're actually checking them off. And then we have this like ritual where we're preparing the new document at the end before the next retrospective meeting. And we're looking, we're like, did we do the things? Oh my gosh, we did all the things. Look at that. Because we looked at it every week. We like remembered. And this, like, we, I think, I think we have over the past couple of months, I think we've recognized that we both need or not we both, because we're, we're, we're a lot of people, we're six people, right? So we need both visual supports to do anything. And we are also visually overstimulated. Both of those things are our truths and we have to figure out how to navigate that. Yeah. Um, You know, this concept of like small changes, big impact, like what just came up this morning in our, in our retro meeting, um, was the fact that like people are drained by talking and we, for like 15 minutes, we just stopped talking. We had like a lot of interaction in the chat, but like nobody talking. It's one thing when like someone, when someone's facilitating with mouth words and then the participants are in the chat, like that's cool. But what if the facilitator is drained by talking? Like, what do you do with that? Um, and that's like, I don't know, I've never sat in a group of, of team members and not tried to, it's like the over-rehearsed neural pathway of talking all the time, even while knowing that talking drains my battery. Yeah. And, and it was cool that it was like real time. So again, like the whole meta thing, like we're talking about, you know, what drains your battery. And then it's like, oh, well, lots of verbal communication, speaking, mouth words sometimes can drain your battery. And it's like, well, then let's just right now, let's just not talk and just start using the chat, you know? And so um, that kind of like real time responsiveness to like, well, let's just try doing the thing right now. You know, I think that's pretty cool. I also think it's been helpful for people to talk about their own, like their own experiments. So we have like team experiments and we have like solo experiments. So like Lizzie talking about, I think like last month or the month before, like I'm blocking out my schedule, that this is when I do these types of tasks as a block. And then today, Sarah, you were like, I think, you know, I, last month I started blocking up my schedule and now I can work on kid connections and I'm getting dopamine from doing this because it's really rewarding to find kids and teens 
make friends and this is great. And anyways, and then like, you know, so then Sierra was like, you know, maybe I'll block out time because I really want to do this task that takes dedicated brain space to do. And I don't know necessarily that, you know, in, in a world where even when folks have access to an idea that doesn't mean they have access to implementation. That's like a completely, that's like another step of the motor plan. So like, I might know that like this thing is draining my battery, but like, I also can't like, like, for example, my battery is so drained by the state of affairs that is my desk right now, but I do not have spoons to do anything about it. Um, and yet if like someone else had been like, I was really struggling with my desk and like, I, did this thing and it was helpful for me like and that thing was actually something relatable as opposed to like yeah you know i and then like fill in the blank like something that doesn't apply to, to my brain and my life you know all right that's good i'm so glad that you have that but that's not like i i, I i'm not i can't clean anything as i can't i can't Yeah, I think we do a lot of reflecting and learning from each other. And we a lot of us have similar brains in terms of how we think about things. And so like strategies that may work or experiments that may work for one person, like may definitely work for somebody else, you know, and they're worth trying. And I like how our meeting is like a reflectory meeting um, that we save the brainstorming for another time. I think that's a really interesting component. And I loved when at the end, Today, when everything was in the chat, including your facilitation, Mel, I've never sat in a meeting like that and it worked amazing and it was just beautiful. Yeah, and like, but it, but it is interesting, like, I almost feel like I'm going to take like a post it note or an index card or something and like prop it up in front of me to remember, like, you know, use that chat, right? Because I, I've, I've, that thing an hour ago, I've never facilitated a meeting in the chat before, so I don't have any motor plant. I don't have any repetitions for it. So I'm always as a dyspraxic person, I'm always going to gravitate toward my over rehearsed neural pathways, which is to talk, even though even though it is the thing that is hardest for me. What do you remember about when you first started working here? Like none of us have ever worked any, like including myself, like no, none of us have ever worked anywhere where like you did these things that you talked about these things that like access was the lens. So like what's, what's been that journey for you? I think I'm, I'm definitely still on learning that journey. Yeah, for sure. It's um that that those pathways are 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 well worn um that you know uh, you know do you got this you can do it by yourself you know you'll figure it out you know and and your needs won't be met so why bother you know it's it's you're 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 aware of it now but in the moment when something even harder is happening it creeps back up, it creeps back up. And you're like, I, you know, and, and you're not, you're literally not aware, you're not matching the pattern because matching mm -hmm. the pattern is a, is a cortex skill of like, there I go again, you know, um, doing my over rehearsed neural pathway where I torture myself. Like I'm even trying, I'm even trying like with, with safe people, including with patients, like if I'm doing a group medical appointment and I'm like feeling my like brain fog creep up and I'm like, like, like that is, that's that that's what happens when you don't have, when I don't have my access needs met is that like my I don't I don't use energy appropriately and you know my mitochondria don't work and my blood flow doesn't work and all of it so like I'm just I'm modeling of like yeah I feel terrible I need to be laying back and like now I'm laying back right and like you should too right um you know yeah I'm actually finding that I need to you know I need to shut the lights off I need to change the temperature. I need to stop using math words and type in the chat. Like I need to, I need to do this. And I, I'm going to model that because what would it be like to everybody just live in a world where everyone just did that? And I don't know, it's not, there's things that we have agency over, you know, like when people talk, you know, Olivia, you brought up like this, my needs are not going to get mad or, you know, somebody else talked about the system, you know, like there's so many things that, that we don't, you know, we, the collective, we like don't have, don't have, you know, the agency or autonomy or privilege to influence in this world. 
Um, but there, but maybe there is something that, that we do, like, you know, after I had COVID, Lizzie, you taught me the idea of like, I, th I, th I think you feel better when the lights are off. So now, like when I get more brain fog or whatever, I, I'll remember Lizzie saying, why don't you turn the lights off? And like, I go and I get up and I turn the lights off and it, it really does extend my battery life. It's little things. And like, I, fortunately, I, even in like other places where I've worked, where I didn't have my access needs met, I don't think anyone would have prevented me from, from shutting the lights off, you know, like little things. Oh, maybe. But yeah, we're so often taught to override our needs, right? All the time, actually, all the time. Yeah. Yes. And it starts so young. It starts like, you know, it starts as in, in, in childhood, you know, like when you're taught there's one correct way to be in the world, you learn to override your needs. Yeah, and I think just like at Brain Club, when people are coming and like learning new language to explain their experience, and then they're able to take that and maybe see things with a different lens and and pull that information back into other parts of their life, you know, and go into situations with a different lens because of having a new narrative, um, self narrative, kind of like about their experience. Um, I think that's true working at All Brains Belong too. When you talk about you know how have things shifted since you started working with All Brains Belong, I think it's like, you know, just having a different, having new language, like changing the narrative and using that in other parts of my life. Cause you're right, Olivia, like the world isn't set up to like have your access needs met. And so like having that, um, that lens, like is like something that I've brought with me to other things in my life um, that I wouldn't have, that I didn't have before. Um, all right, I'm going to share screen. So two years ago, we asked our community advisory board, how will we know that our community has become more neuroinclusive? And I know I, sh I, I, I like use this slide a lot, um, but there we go. All right, so how will we, how will, you know, when we asked our community advisory board two years ago, how will we know that our community has become more neuroinclusive? Like, I'm not even really sure that at this point that we necessarily talked about access needs in literally everything we do until this time. So we did this activity with the community advisory board. This is what we got back and we're like, okay, this is the new compass. We are going to talk about access needs everywhere we go. And we are going to model what it looks like to shift your paradigm to be focused on access, right? So, so just anyway, um, the other day when we were at Montpelier Pride and people from our community came up to us, and I don't know if anybody else noticed this, um, but people were like spontaneously casually, like no big deal, just like throwing it like, oh yeah, well, you know, I learned about my, you know, and I, I was talking about my access needs at work. And I was like, yeah, I've been talking about my access needs with my mom, you know, it's just like, it's happening. It's freaking happening. So that's really cool. That's really cool because it, it's free to, Shift your language and the way you, I don't know, like be around people doing the thing. That's like culture, right? Like it's culture is like just shared, shared language, shared practices, shared whatever. And so, you know, if we all do it, it kind of catches on. Yeah, and I think the idea of like doing micro things, like not like I think it can be overwhelming to be like, what are my access needs? Like, how do I accomplish like meet those? You know, it can feel like daunting. And so I think the idea, like the example you gave of like dimming your lights, it it can be like 
1% changes and those can add up. Like if there's uh, enough areas of your life that you can just shift by like 1%, um, it can add up. Yeah. Yeah, because all those 1% or whatever percent a change you make is creating more space because you're not, your brain's not stressed out. Yeah. Or not stressed out as much. As much. You have a little right. bit more capacity. Right. Right. And I think right. even like just even the lens shift of like, I have a finite capacity because I'm a human being, right? And the capacity I have now as a person with chronic illness is different than the capacity I had before. Um, and certainly different than before I became a parent or before a head injury or like any, all the things, right? And so I have a funny capacity and that capacity is, is, is different than the capacity of like the me of yesteryear. And what does that mean about my needs? What does that mean for like the little things that need to happen to have more space? Yeah, totally. It's fluid over several years. It's fluid over like situations in your life. It's fluid like morning to afternoon. Like just knowing that it's fluid, I think is is a really helpful lens. And it's a big shift from being like, well, I always need this for my access need. And that's what I always need. It's like, well, some days I need that. Some days I don't, you know, it depends. Fluctuating capacity is is the norm. And no one tells you that. No one tells you that. Like if someone had taught me that as a young child, that there would be times where I could do the thing and right. times where I could not do the thing, like the impact on self-concept, self-efficacy, you know, just be, it'd be huge. Right. Cause we not only like don't share that information with children, but we actively do the opposite. So we're like, you could tie your shoes yesterday. Why can't you tie your shoes today? Like just do the thing. And the so thing. we drive home we drive home that point that like if you could do it yesterday why can't you do it today and it's a huge paradigm shift to be like well fluctuating capacity is a real thing for children and adults yes and so whether you know explicitly or implicitly when you get the message that you know you did it yesterday you should be able to do the thing if you can't, that reflects that you are lazy, that you don't care, that you're this, that you're that, you know, like all of it. And whether you like it, even if it's implied or, or, or just even the, even, even um, if there's not like a truth shared to explain that, the sweet little love makes up a story. And the story is, I'm lazy, I'm this, you know, I'm incompetent. And then like the imposter syndrome, like they're gonna find out that actually I'm incompetent and I can't really do the thing consistently, you know, just all of that. As we do right. it simultaneously. <laughs> yes. Right. And the narrative is like, what's wrong with me? Why can't I do the thing? So I think it's like it, we're changing generations by having these conversations, right? Because like we're talking about it and then our, our children are going to benefit from these conversations and hopefully their children will benefit that much more like just by talking about these things. The best thing, so the, the, uh, we, we, can, we can edit this out if, if, if you don't want to talk about the story, Sarah, but um, last night, Sarah and I were out with our children, with our families, and um, we were playing the I'm going on a picnic game. And as as not only did cognitive load increase because you're like you know later on in, in the in the rounds you have like more you know i'm going on a picnic i'm gonna bring an apple and a banana that game you know for the whole alphabet um not only does the task get harder but now i've been doing the task for longer so i'm draining my battery it's also getting later i'm also like i've gone longer without food and drink you know like you, you could just see the, the the resources the capacity just dwindle and so what did we do we're we just started like we didn't we didn't actually name you know i'm gonna help you now because you need help we just started like scaffolding the experience it was like you know we just started doing gestures for, for for like charade cues, or we started like naming the letter that came next, or we made a joke about the thing, or, you know, we just, we just started doing it. And, 
you know, your sweet little love finished the game. And I think felt genuinely good about himself afterwards. Yeah, totally. He was proud. And I think, you know, that is like something that we talk a lot about in our family is like, that's part of his vocabulary is the word scaffolding at nine years old. Like he uses that all the time. He's like, I can do this, but I'm going to need some scaffolding, you know? And I just like, I love that. Like, I love that it's just like normalized. It's like, yep, I'm going to need your support. I'm going to need to body double. I'm going to need somebody with me. I'm going to need you to remind me whatever it is. And there's no shame in it. It's just like, yeah, I can see that your capacity is dwindling. So I'm going to step in and help support you so that you can get to the end. Cause I know you really want to get to the end. So let's help you get there. Oh, that was my favorite part. Um, mm. Like what a what a world. I mean, so I mean, I think you what you heard many times from our team is the the concept of like unlearning and rewriting like the those old narratives. Um, you know, and and we talk about this a lot at Brain Club, right? Like just the unlearning of the myth of independence. And you know all all of that stuff, and and to have a generation of young children grow up saying, "I'm gonna need some scaffolding," like, like what a what a world we could have. Anyway, so I would love, I would love to open open up the floor for anyone who. Would like to share what's what's uh coming to mind for you about this topic Ooh, um shimmer is sharing i got my dream job working at a high profile barber shop on sunset and had to quit just a few months ago in because of the stuff i just learned here yeah, meaning meaning your access needs were not met. You were thwarted. You thought it was your dream job, but the environment thwarted you. I'm so sorry that happened. And I'm really proud of you for exiting a situation that doesn't serve you. It's so hard. And I think I should also name that there's lots of people who are in situations that they come to learn are bad for them, that are harmful to them, that are, you know, thwarting them, that are traumatizing them, that all of these things. And, and, and there's, there, there is so much privilege to being able to leave a situation for a lot of people. And so I want to name that too. You know, many people sharing in the chat about like just struggling for long periods of time um, and not knowing why and now 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 acquiring the lens for that. I think that's pretty powerful. And it's, you know, it's never too late. It's never too late to acquire this lens. Hi, uh, my name's Ellie. I'm actually a psychologist and I work in North Carolina and I just wanted to thank you. This is my first brain club, but I'm working with more and more adolescents with autism and it's just so helpful to get the language. So just to emphasize that, thank you. That's amazing. Thank you for sharing. I'm so glad you're here. Hi, Naomi. I, I can't tell if you're, if, if you're blocking the sun or if you're raising your hand, but so go for it. Um, I am a, a psychologist. I'm licensed in Massachusetts and Vermont. And um, I took a hiatus from working because of some health issues. And I have um, a kind of cancer that can give me a lot of fatigue and side effects, but um, isn't going to kill me. Um, and it's almost like the cancer has given me more permission than the autism. And it shouldn't be that way. I'm gonna you know, to to say what you're saying about I have finite capacity or that capacity fluctuating is normal. And that and I think you know that image that comes to me is like the battery 
that you have in something, it's not just a zero to a hundred, that it doesn't work as well when it gets below 32. And in my family, uh, thank you, Mel, for the waving of hands, we say, or I would say like, you know, shields down to 25%, Captain, and like, you know, uh, I don't know, when I, my kids were little or when they were babies, you know, I'd say like, I can feel crabby snappy alligator coming. It was like one of my like IFS parts, you know, it's like I, I will just have a meltdown or snap or scream, not because I want to, but because I'm maxed out. But I didn't know until so recently with my own autism diagnosed um, and then all the languaging that's come up you know, this idea of a, an autistic meltdown. And I think that what I want to add to the conversation is <clears throat> we need to build in and normalize that when someone takes care of themselves by saying no. And I learned this from the consent and sex positivity education I had later in life, that when somebody says no, we say, thanks for taking care of yourself by telling me that, you know, dot, dot, dot. And so you're reflecting what they say, but you're also, you're celebrating it and you give, it's not just, it's just, you need to overcompensate for all those years of holistic shame to just say, um, uh, sorry, I got distracted, uh, to say like, hey, I did it, like to have pride and to tell the other person to have pride and to, uh, you know, I often will adopt the Ariana Grande where if I say sorry, I'll just follow it up with not sorry because it's like lizard brain is saying sorry because I, I don't know, vagina, I don't know. And and I'm not sorry. So it's just like this like stupid um, instant thing that we say. So I really liked also the nonverbal piece because I've been in some groups where the leader is very rigid uh, at A, A and E and says like, no one can use the chat, but she doesn't acknowledge it's because of her own uh, limitations. And then other groups where they use the chat or they use Discord and they understand that we need nonverbal, but she didn't even know that she was discriminating against autistics in the midst. So she just got grumpy. And so culture change is such an important thing and um, I'll stop there because I, I will say, and this is what I call my DOS code, uh, for those of you who are old enough to know what DOS code is, um, that I will I can't stop myself easily. So I will say, um, you know, mic drop over. And that's uh, that's my way of stopping the train because I have this inertia of it's hard to get started and it's hard to stop. And the last thing I want to say is, and I don't know if anyone else has this, but um, it's harder for me to process receptive language than earlier in my life. And a lot of autistics at midlife who are women in the groups I've been in talk about sort of having some high tide tsunami full moon that just floods them and puts them over some edge or maybe it's related to yeah. menopause well well Na naomi i think that's very that's very common for people i think of all genders um and um it, it's it's in fact um that's going to come up heavily next week at brain club and um i'll make sure to i'll i'll, I'll describe i'll describe um more more about that um in a, in a few minutes about what next week's brain club is thank you so much for sharing i'm so glad you're here thank you for doing this mal it's um it's so needed Awesome. Sierra. Um, I just wanted to say something that um, reminded me of what you brought up, Naomi, was this, this job that I have now is the first time where I've, if I've talked about, you know, taking a day off or taking a vacation, it's met with like, oh, yeah, I'm so happy you're doing that. How can we support you? Versus the like, you know, whatever it is, whether it's, I don't want you to do that, or just like, you, you can feel it from, from supervisors sometimes. Um, and I think that was, that was a change I didn't realize. And I didn't realize that was something that was an access need of mine. Um, but just, it's, it's amazing how much of a change it can feel when people are like, oh yeah, you, I'm glad you're taking care of yourself. And that's, that's a really great thing. Well, I'm glad that's your experience. Um, and I, I know it's, it's, 
like you hear these things and you're like, why is this radical? And yet it's kind of radical. Yeah, like having focusing on the physical as the reason to slow down and meet your access needs, that that's the only thing that would cause you to do that, right? So like, I think about like Dr. Gabor Mate when he like talks about um, people's obituaries and how we can tell a lot about our culture by looking at obituaries that are like, they worked till the bitter end and they did, they were always selfless and put everybody for, you know, to the point where like, they weren't meeting their own access needs, you know, and and how important it is to kind of learn that the earlier we can learn it, the better, you know, and, and that it's never too late to learn it. But just that we don't have to wait till we're like run down and exhausted and burnt out to meet our access needs, that it's OK to, you know, preemptively identify and it helps to be surrounded by other people who who um, are also trying to identify their access needs because, you know, it can kind of inspire you to say, well, I never really thought about that. Like I was saying in the video, you know, those like tiny little gains, you know. Um, but yeah, I mean, that's that's what I think Brain Club is allowing us to do is to like have these conversations and learn about, you know, that it might just be little tiny changes that add up. Thank you, Sarah. And I, yeah, I, I, I think also, I mean, you're really describing culture and the impact of, of, of culture. And so, you know, the, the, the same culture that has this like, you know, shared understanding that we write the obituaries in this way, et cetera, is like, those are the same factors that throughout an entire lifetime overly glorify, you know, individualism and you know this and that and the other thing and you know as we've talked about so many times in brain club so many of these you know these 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 characteristics of a culture are all embedded in racism white supremacy culture all of the other discriminatory isms that go on and so like once you know that and you spot that and at least my brain like i can't unsee it now and so like oh no, I reject this. Martha says in the chat, sometimes I can tell myself that the best thing I can do for others is to take good enough care of myself that I don't become dependent on them. Um, I, I have next to no spoons for the more typical give to others activities. Right. I mean, so just uh, I uh, what Naomi said, that reminds me of what Naomi said about, um, you know, um, uh how how when whatever the factors are that force one to reckon with having a finite capacity um you know i i also wish that it didn't require chronic illness to arrive upon that but i also like i'm i had to learn it eventually and i wasn't learning it before And I agree, Sarah, that this all ties into interdependence, the idea of being, um, you know, part of a community where it's normalized um, to be connected to and relying on, not dependent upon. It's, I don't see it that way. I see it as interconnected and, you know, mutually supportive. Um, yeah. So I think this is also a a a, a good transition um, to to tell you about next week's brain club. So next week's brain club is um, our monthly book chat. So this month we'll be discussing "Fall Down Seven Times, Get Up Eight by Naoki Higashida. Um, this is the same author who wrote "The Reason I Jump." Um, which was, I think, the first the first ever book club book chat that that we did uh, done at Brain Club. We've done it a couple times because we love it so much. Anyway, um, this book is um written by um a non speaking autistic author. Um, the reason I jump uh, was written um when he was thirteen. Um, he wrote the whole book um by by using a letter board um by pointing. Um, and this this book was written in the same way. I think he was in his early 20s when he wrote this book. Um, I I find anything he writes that I read, I find that I learn about my own brain um, uh, through his descriptions of like, that is how that is. That is absolutely how that is. So so this book is like that. And I look forward to sharing, sharing it with you uh, next week.
Um, and uh, uh, Martha's asked about what the Bring Club theme for July will be. So Bring Club in July, the theme is the double empathy problem. That's not something we're always talking about here for those of you who are new to Bring Club. Um, so, oh, thank you. Thank, thank you, Eleanor. That's really helpful. Um, uh, Universal Design. So that's that's great to know that um, that the, the Libby app is a way that you can get it as as uh, as audiobook. That's wonderful. Thank you. Um, July's Brain Club, the double empathy problem. So that's a term coined by Dr. Damian Milton, who is an autistic social scientist in the UK. And the double empathy problem refers to um, that when there is a mismatch between communication style and worldview, that's where, you know, miscommunication, communication breakdowns happen. That it's not like, here are the people with the normal social skills, and then there's, you know, the rest of us over here. Um, it's it's about that mismatch um, um, and difficulty perspective taking in both directions when there's a, a mismatch of, of, of worldview and communication style. So we'll be taking a look at that in the context of relationships. Relationships, um, in healthcare, in employment, um, in all in all the context. So that's that's what we've got coming up in July. Thanks for the question. All right. Thanks, everybody. Thanks for being here. Thanks for being part of our community. We look forward to seeing you next week. Bye.